The son of promise. That's what dad calls me. The son of promise. According to him, if all of God's promises are going to come true, they will have to come true through me. No pressure growing up, right? But I guess when you become a father at age 100, you're allowed to be a little eccentric. Laughter. That's what mom calls me. Laughter. Well, I guess everyone calls me that. My name, Isaac, means laughter. But for mom, it was more than just a name. The way she tells the story, mom named me laughter because of her joy at finally having a baby at such an advanced age. I mean, I get it. Around here, not having kids is grounds for divorce. But dad was always a little different from our neighbors. He loved mom all those years, even though they couldn't have any children. So when I finally came along, it's no wonder mom left. But you see, I've also heard dad tell the story of my naming. And because I'm always the son of promise to him, he tells it a little differently. Oh, your mom laughed when you were born, all right, he says. But I remember how she laughed the year before. Laughed at an angel of God. Can you believe it? He usually pats his belly and shakes his great beard at that point for emphasis. Sarah laughed and laughed at the promise that she would give me a son from her own body. Never laugh at the promises of God, boy. Your God can do the impossible. You have to stick out your chin when you say it. Your God can do the impossible. That's dad for you. So you can call me Isaac, or Laughter, or even Son of Promise. They're all related. Though I remember a time when they didn't seem related at all. Dad clung to that Son of Promise bit. But mom sure didn't laugh when she found out later after it was all over. You might not know, but my dad is kind of a big deal in these parts. Although we don't come from around here, dad's pretty well off. And he gets a lot of respect. So it wasn't all that crazy for the old eccentric to decide we were going on a field trip. Especially if it meant a chance to worship his god. A god our neighbors honestly didn't quite understand. I'm not sure dad quite understood God all the time either, but even when he didn't understand completely, dad trusted. So the almighty God said, field trip, and dad packed up the donkey. <laughs> Mom made some falafel to go and had us each take a servant along. You know, just in case. Mom's like that. I remember being pretty excited about going on the, on the adventure with dad. I knew the trip was something special because we had to cut wood for the sacrifice before we left. Dad didn't think we would find enough kindling at higher elevations. So we packed firewood in the tinderbox and headed up into the mountains. On the third day, Dad called for a halt. I distinctly remember what he said before the servants. Wait here with the donkey while I and the boy go a bit further to that peak in the distance. There we will worship and then we will come back to you. Dad took the tinderbox and I offered to carry the wood, so he put it in my shoulders. It was heavier than I, than I expected, and I got a few splinters on my way up the hill. It wasn't until we were almost there that I did the math. Hey, Dad? I asked when we stopped for a breather. I see fire, and I see wood. But where's the lamb for the burnt offering? You forgot the most important part. Dad just stuck out his chin and said, as if he were trying to convince himself more than me, God himself will provide the lamb for the sacrifice, my son. At the time, it almost sounded like a promise, but a promise he was working hard to believe. I'm not sure how Dad knew exactly where to stop, but it was a beautiful spot. You could hear a spring nearby, and the hill we were on looked down on a young grove of olives on one side and up to a limestone peak on the other. Trunks of limestone littered our hill too, and it only took a dozen or so to put a suitable altar together. We laid out the wood carefully in a kind of bowl, so it would cradle the offering while it burned. Dad placed the firebox right next to the limestone, and then turned to face me. He didn't threaten, he didn't beg, he didn't try to explain. But I think he was praying under his breath 
as he tenderly but firmly tied me hand and foot. If he had panicked, I think I would have panicked too. But Dad just methodically prepared my body for sacrifice. It was all he could manage to get me up on the wood, and I caught a whiff of his old man sweat as he laid me down on the altar. He anointed me with the oil of the sacrifice, and it felt warm and sticky as it ran down my forehead. The sharp smell of myrrh in the olive oil was almost stifling, like I was drowning, and a deep terror began to rise in me. I didn't want to die. I couldn't imagine my own father ending me like this. His hopes and dreams for the future were tied up with me and my future. I knew what the promise meant to him. Everything I thought I knew suddenly didn't make any sense. Silently, the ceremonial knife appeared in his hand. I felt paralyzed. All I could do was watch. I wouldn't tell everyone this, but I'll admit to you. Lying there on the wood, oil running down my head, feeling like I was going to drown. I was no longer sure there was a God of promise. I was no longer sure there was a God at all. Finally, Dad spoke. Isaac, my son, he cried. Then he stuck out his chin and said, Your God can do the impossible. And he raised the knife. What I saw in his eyes at that moment took away my doubts. What I saw wasn't fear on his face, or at least it wasn't only fear. But I also saw love. I saw pride, but above all, I saw trust. Dad always put the trust in the promise of God at the center of our family life. You know why he moved from back home to this strange place, right? Because God told him to. My father didn't have a plan or destination in mind. God promised. God said, field trip. So Dad went. That dependence on God's promise is what I saw in his eyes. Even as the blade of the knife caught in the sunlight and flashed, he told me later that the way he figured it, God could raise the dead if he wanted to. I mean, there I was, the son of promise, living proof that the Almighty could bring life out of dead bodies. If I died and stayed dead, then all of God's promise couldn't come true. But Dad wasn't willing to accept that. I was born a miracle and a promise, he said. And a God who could bring life from death was a God to be trusted, even when it didn't make sense. Maybe his trust was contagious, or maybe it's just the way I was raised. But once I saw the trust in his eyes, I didn't even try to escape. I didn't try to roll off that altar and run for the police. I mean, the cords on my hands were pretty tight. Dad had to cut them off afterwards. But the cords on my ankles? I think Dad intentionally left them loose. And if his teenage son of promise escaped from a man who was over a hundred years old, who could blame him? But I didn't try to get away. Dad trusted God's promise. I trusted my dad, and the sacrificial knife flashed in the sunlight. Dad put his hands over my eyes, and I couldn't see what was going to happen next. Only at that moment, at the last possible moment, did God show up. Abraham! Abraham! It was the voice of the angel of the Lord, a voice that echoes in my dreams to this day. Here I am, Dad says, just like always. God speaks, Abraham listens. That's just the way it is. But this time, I could hear the voice too. Don't lay a hand on the boy. I have seen, and now I know, that you trust me above all else, since you are willing to give me your son, your son of promise. With a great sob, Dad throws down the knife and grabs me off of the firewood, like a younger father would have picked up his baby from a crib. And he holds me tight and tells me he loves me, as tears run down into that great beard of his. That embrace, he later said, was like he had actually gotten me back from the grave. He fully intended to kill me that day, thinking, hoping, and trusting that God could raise the dead in order to keep his promises. But for the entire trip, three long days, I seemed dead to him. 
and now he had me back to life. So dad was a mess. Okay, I'll admit, I was pretty shaken up too. <laughs> but as we stood there in an awkward hug, have you ever tried hugging someone with both arms tied behind your back? Dad looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in a thorn bush. I told you, he laughed, the Lord will provide. That's been the name of the mountain ever since. The Lord will provide. We have a family saying, I know I'll be passing on to my kids and grandkids. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. So dad cut me loose. We put the sacrifice on the altar, on my altar. I remember that the ram fit nicely into the dent my own body made in the kindling. And as I watched the smoke rise to heaven, I couldn't help thinking that I have a God of promise, that my God provided a substitute in my place, that my God can do the impossible. Sorry, you have to stick out your chin when you say it. Your God can do the impossible. <laughs> you should have seen the look we got from the servants. I think we left the whole way home.